The ancient Romans were xenophobic, oppressive, and prejudiced, but they were not racist. In the Roman Empire, the slaves were not of a certain race or color, but there was a mixture of blacks, whites, browns, Germanics, Thracians, Greeks, and so on. Becoming a slave in those ancient times depended on which family I was born to, what my financial situation was, and whether my land was captured by the enemies next door. Now let's fast forward to the 19th century. 90% of the slaves in the Western Hemisphere are now black-skinned, and racism has been developing rapidly. What happened? After the discovery of Americas, there was a need for large and cheap labor to work in the plantations. The Spanish and Portuguese were using the Native Americans as slaves, but then diseases were brought from Europe to South America, and many of these Native Americans were dying, and they could no longer provide the required labor force. The need for a large and cheap labor was even greater in the sugar plantations of Brazil, Caribbeans, and North America. The Europeans had to come up with a solution. But the Portuguese had already found the solution. Africa. Africa was one of the poorest continents on earth. The level of poverty in many areas was just unprecedented. Slavery was already happening in Africa way before the Europeans arrived. But when the Europeans did arrive, slave trade became large-scaled. In 1619, a Portuguese ship was carrying several hundred African slaves from Angola, taking them to Mexico. But along the way, a British pirate ship intercepts. They capture the ship and take the Africans to Virginia instead. The Africans were sold right there. This event marks the beginning of United States entry into the transatlantic slave trade network. From this point on, the French, the English, the Dutch and the Danish, they all joined the game. They follow in the footsteps of the Portuguese. They go to West Africa, they buy slaves, and they ship them over the Atlantic. It is as of this moment in history, the 1600s and after, that status in the colonies was defined by race. And this is really the main difference between the ancient world and the colonialism world. By looking at somebody's skin, you knew immediately what her social standing was. During the Enlightenment, a large number of philosophers and scientists in Europe begin to change the way people think. For example, the British philosopher John Locke. Locke argues that human beings have certain natural rights. For example, life, freedom, property. According to Locke, people cannot even voluntarily surrender these rights, let alone other people just coming and taking the rights away from them. Locke also argues for the freedom of thought, speech, and religion. Many ideas of John Locke and other philosophers find their way into the American Constitution. Here is the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You can see the freedom of speech and press, also on top, religion. The Fifth Amendment. The government protects the right to private property for all its citizens.
also believe that this commercialized society that humans have been creating is taking a lot of freedom away from its citizens, specifically the lower class. So humans have to unlock the chains and go back to their state of nature, which is freedom. Also believe that all men are born equal. Inequality is an artificial creation, so men can dominate and exploit each other. And here is another consequence of the Age of Enlightenment, the French Revolution. It can be summarized by three words, liberty, equality, and fraternity. So you can see what's happening here. The ideas of the Age of Enlightenment were not compatible with the concept of slavery. In slavery, a lot of individual rights are taken away, such as freedom, such as the right to property, and so on. As a result, a lot of anti-slavery groups were established as early as the 1700s, and in response to those, pro-slavery groups were established as well and an ideological warfare began among them. The pro-slavery groups were justifying why the black race was the inferior race. For example, many Africans did not have a religion. They were non-Christian, non-Jewish, and non-Muslims. And in those times, this was bad enough. In the 1800s, a German physician named Blumenbach was trying to classify the human race. And this is the diagram he came up with. He placed the Caucasians at the top, Africans and Asians in the middle, and the Native Americans at the bottom. Blumenbach claimed that the people of a specific area called the Caucasus have the most beautiful faces. Caucasus covers parts of Russia, Georgia, Armenia, and so on. And the word Caucasian is derived from Caucasus. Now, very likely Blumenbach was looking at females' faces only. Regardless, he created a model based on the perfection of race. The more perfect race went at the top, and the least perfect race went at the bottom. Let me emphasize that Blumenbach was just an anthropologist, he was not a racist, but his idea and model will be used by other racial theorists of the 19th century. They were trying to prove that there is a master race. The racial theorists changed the connotation of the word Caucasian. Now Caucasian includes all white people of Europe. Secondly, the racial theorists claimed that the Caucasians aren't just better biologically, but they are better culturally and intellectually as well. For example, Caucasians were the initiators of Renaissance. They created more arts and more literature. Scientific revolution started in Europe. Classical physics started with the Caucasian. Europeans have had more inventions in their history. They have explored the world. They have captured more territories. They created bigger empires. All of this proved that the Caucasians outcompeted the Africans in many different ways. Therefore, they must be the better race. Here is another one for you. This illustration is from a book named Types of Mankind, published in 1854. The authors claimed that on an evolutionary tree, the black Africans are halfway between the Caucasians and the chimps. So the chimpanzees evolved to black Africans first, and then to the Caucasians. The source of data comes from an American anthropologist named George Morton. Morton performed an extensive research. He measured the size of the cranium and the skulls of the chimpanzees, the black Africans, and the Caucasians. And he found that the cranium size of the black Africans 
is about halfway between the Caucasians and the chimps. Since they had a smaller cranium size, therefore their brains must be smaller, therefore they must be intellectually inferior. So you can see that there is an ideological battle going on between these two groups. The anti-slavery groups argue on humanitarian terms, mostly influenced by the ideas of the Age of Enlightenment. The pro-slavery groups used a lot of science to make their theories look more convincing. So who do you think won this war? History shows us that the anti-slavery groups won it. So, slavery is over, but racism is not. In fact, in some places, racism gets worse. For example, in some of the southern states of the United States, the black kids and the white kids, they cannot go to the same school. In some places, they have even segregated the parks, the swimming pools, the restaurants. In the buses, the blacks mostly have to sit in the back, the whites at the front. Why was this happening? The main cause was money. Some people lost a lot of money after the slave trade was over. And now the slave owners had to pay the black workers. And of course, some white people were arguing that the blacks were primarily brought to the Americas so they can build the nation, they can generate wealth for the nation. But now they're just going to take our jobs. They're going to take our lands and properties. Why don't we just ship them back? The foundation of this theory that the blacks were the inferior race was already established in the 19th century. Lots of persuasive arguments were given and many of them had become culturally rooted. In my opinion, it's much easier to change a law, but it's much harder to change people's beliefs. Here I'm offering four reasons why the roots of racism weakened in the second half of the 20th century. The Nazis were probably the most racist regime on this planet, and the racism was against other ethnicities and nationalities, not just the blacks. After the atrocities that were committed in the Second World War, people began experiencing anger against racism itself. So they were like, enough is enough. Let's end this all together. The foundation of a Soviet ideology was non-racial. For example, a black pizza delivery man, a white doctor, a white auto mechanic, a black university professor would all be theoretically equal in status and income in a Soviet system. In reality, there was racism in the Soviet Union, but the Soviet propaganda machine worked a little differently. They often promoted friendship of peoples, they denied prejudice within the Soviet borders, and they condemned it elsewhere in the world, including the United States. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was probably one of the most important causes of the abolishment of racial segregation and discrimination. 